All right, and now for number 11, we have an excellent deriv deri blah, 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 derivatives problem, see? So we have to consider the function f of x equals blah, okay, blah being this. x cannot equal 0 because x is on the denominator, and if you divide by 0, the world explodes. So part a, we have find the derivative of f of x. So first things first, all right, for f of x, x squared minus 3 divided by x, we need to do the derivative of this. See? Now, the following derivative is in your formula booklet, all right? But basically, it has to do with how to do the derivative of an exponent, all right? And so, before you face, okay, or you do the derivative, I suggest that you make life easier on yourself. And if you have a variable and an exponent like we do here, put it up top, okay? Just put it up top. It's going to be easier to do the derivative, whatever. It's going to be more intuitive, etc. see? So if I go ahead and rewrite this, see I have x squared minus 3 divided by x. This would be the same as 3 times x to the power of negative 1. See? Now some of you are probably thinking, what the fuck? Why? See? And so let me show you a quick math pattern that I think is going to be very enlightening for some of you. So let's say I have 2 cubed, 2 squared, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of negative 1, 2 to the power of negative 2, and 2 to the power of negative 3. And I ask you, yo, find all of these, okay? Now, maybe you don't know about the ones in negative, see, or even the one to the power of 0, but you do know the ones up here, see? So 2 to the power of 3 is 2 times 2 times 2, see? Which is going to give you 8, all right? Yeah, both. Uh, 2 to the power of 2 is going to be 2 times 2, it's 4. 2 to the power of 1 is 2. 2 to the power of 0 is going to be 1, see? And right here, some of you are probably know it by memory, uh, anything to the power of 0 is 1, but maybe, maybe they don't know why, see? So if I ask you to go from 8 to 4, what can you do to go from 8 to 4? Ah, you can divide by 2. From 4 to 2, what can you do? You can divide by 2. From 2 to 1, you can divide by 2 again, see? And this is a pattern that shows up with exponents, see? That is why anything to the power of 0 is equal to 1, because you divide it by itself so many times that you end up reaching 1, see? It also happens with, just a quick example, 3 to the power of 3 is 27, 3 to the power of 2 is 9, 3 to the power of 1 is 3, 3 to the power of 0 is 3, see? You divide it, sorry, it's, fuck, my bad. 3 to the power of 0 is 1, see? And again, it's the same pattern. Here you're dividing by 3, dividing by 3, dividing by 3. You end up dividing it by itself so many times that it's inevitable that you reach 1, see? So that is why any 2 to the power of 0 is 1. And now let's talk a little bit about a negative exponent, see? So if I go ahead and keep going with this pattern here that I just showed, and I divide it by 2 again, see? What is 1 divided by 2? It's going to be 1 half. Aha, uh -huh. okay, let's keep going. Well, 1 half divided by 2 is going to be 1 half times 1 half. Cierto? 1 over 4. Aha, uh -huh. interesting, see? 1 half divided by 2 is the same as 1 half times 1 half, 1 over 4. Okay, cool. So, 1 over 4. Let's do it again, see? Bada bim, bada boom, divided by 2, you end up with 1 over 8. All right, cool. So, how does that help me with this negative exponent over here? Well, notice, cierto, that I can rewrite this 2 to the negative 1, this 2 to the negative 2, and this 2 to the negative 3. Because this is 1 half, and this is 1 over 4, and this is 1 over 8, it is the same as, well, 1 over 2 to the power of 1, 1 over 2 to the power of 2, 1 over 2 to the power of 3. And so now that you know all of this, you can make the following sort of like golden rule. Negative exponent means flip it. Whenever there's a negative exponent, you can just sort of flip it. So you can go from this 2 to the power of negative 3, immediately over to 1 over 2 to the power of 3. Cierto? So you just sort of flip it, right? All right, cool. And so if I have a positive exponent on the bottom, I can flip it as well, and I end up with a negative exponent up top. See, so that is all I did. I also explained why it's legal so that none of you can complain about it. And I suggest you do that first before you do the derivative of an exponent. See, you're going to see why in a second. Now, when I do the derivative of an exponent, okay, all you really need to do 
and it's super visual. See, so I'm going to go ahead and explain it that way. You take this two, or you take the exponent, see, you plop it, you put it in front, okay? Your x is still going to be there, and then you do the exponent minus one. I'm going to do the same over here, ¿cierto? So I have a negative from before, ¿cierto? Then I have a negative, I mean, I have a times negative one. I have the three from before. I have the x, and I have my exponent being negative one, minus one, ¿sí? And so, well, the one on the right is much prettier, prettier, prettier ¿sí? But on the right, you can see what the derivative of the exponent actually did, ¿sí? You did the the negative one on the exponent, and you plopped your exponent in front, ¿cierto? So you have negative one times three. All right, so I go ahead and, you know, do this a little more nice. I end up with two x, ¿cierto? Two minus one is just one, ¿cierto? So two x. Uh, negative times negative is positive, so I have two x plus three x minus to the power of negative two, ¿sí? And if you want to leave it super fancy, this would be just the same as 2x plus 3 divided by x squared. So that is for part A. See? Cool. Then they tell us that line L is tangent. Ooh, that's a fancy word. Tangent to f of x at the point of 1, comma, negative 2. And using the thing from part A to find the gradient of L. So when you have something that's tangent, okay, the most classic example would be like in a parabola or something like that. See? So when you have something that's tangent, it touches your line once, never again. Tangent. Touches your line once and never again. All right, cool. So a tangent to this parabola here, ¿cierto? Could maybe be, or a classic, ¿cierto? Is like right at the maximum, ¿sí? So here is a line that, cro that touches only at the maximum and then never again. Another example could be maybe a tangent that goes like that, ¿cierto? Boom. It crosses here, it touches there and then never again, see? So that would be the idea of a tangent, see? And so the cool thing about a tangent, ¿cierto? Is that contrary to this quadratic that I just drew here, ¿cierto? The tangent is a straight line, see? The tangent is a straight line. And so when they ask for the gradient, okay, gradient is the same as slope, see? And so how can the de finding the derivative, ¿cierto? Of f of x help me find the slope of line L. Huh, interesting. So, originally, ¿cierto? Before we did the derivative, okay, before we did the derivative, um, here you have x, here you have y, see? In your, like, number line, I mean, sorry, in your plot, see? You have x and y. And so, when you plug in something for x, you get a value for f of x, see? Let's remember that f of x is the same as, as y, see? So let's say that here I plug in, I don't know, 1, and you get a, a point, ¿cierto? You get that, if you plug in 1, you get 2, you get that set of points, 1, 2, see? It's just an example. If you plug in 2 here, here you get 3, it's another set of points, 2, 3. When you do the derivative, this actually changes completely, see? Because now when you plug in x and you get a value for the derivative of f of, f of x, it's a little bit different, see? What actually changes? So... Now, okay, x is still going to be like an x-coordinate, okay? x is still an x-coordinate, but f derivative f of x, see, is now basically going to be da -da -da -da, slope. That is now slope. It is now rate of change. And so to find the gradient of L, okay, using the part from part A, which is this here, see, all you have to do ¿cierto? is notice where does line L touch f of x. And they tell us that line L is tangent to f of x, so it touches once at the point 1, comma, negative 2. So if I go to my derivative for part b and I plug in 1, I am asking the function, see, before we do the math, okay, I am asking the function right here, when my x value is 1, what is my slope? What I used to ask before is, when my x, x value is 1, what is my y value? Now that I did the derivative, when I plug in 1 here, it's, when my x value is 1, what is my slope? So when my x value is 1, my slope is 2 times 1 plus 3 divided by 1 squared. 
which is the same as 2 plus 3, which is the same as 5. So the gradient of L is 5, period. That is part B. I think the biggest thing to understand is how the derivative changes, like what you plug in, what it means, and stuff like that. So remember, right here, this is super important, man. When you plug in 1, in this stage over here, you're asking your function, what is my slope at x equals 1? Okay? Once you have that in mind, it's actually super easy to solve the rest. See? Or these derivative problems in general. And now for the hardest part, as you can see, it's worth 3 points. We have determine the number of lines parallel to L that are tangent to f of x. And to justify our answer. Alright, so basically, see, basically, our line L has a slope of 5. And there are infinite lines that have a slope of 5. And so which of those lines also touch f of x? That need to have a slope of 5. See? Let's remember what parallel means. Okay? Parallel is when your lines are like this. Okay? They, ne they never touch. That means they have the same slope. M1 equals 2. M1 and M2 being slopes. See? So these would be parallel lines. The other word you might be thinking of is perpendicular. Okay? Perpendicular. Perpendicular is when they're literally like crossing each other see like that or maybe like this all right and perpendicular slopes have worked in the following way like the first slope times the second slope is going to be negative one see what does this imply it, it implies that one is the reciprocal of the other see it's the flip times negative one you might know it that way see now i'm not going to get into perpendicular slopes because that's not the issue here but just so that you know, or you have the math language here, that you have parallel lines, you have perpendicular lines. That's the gist of it. See, so parallel lines is the same slope, right? So the tem determine the number of lines that have the same slope to L that are tangent to f of x, and to justify our answer. All right, so I just found out that the slope is 5. See, when x is 1, the slope is 5. And so now I can ask it sort of like, the other way around, see? Now I can take the, my entire f of x thing, ¿cierto? And since I identified that this is slope, the whole thing, ¿cierto? And this x is, what is my slope when x is what? Or when x is 1, when x is 2, etc. If I take this whole thing and I equal it to 5, ¿cierto? It'll look like this. I can have 5 equals, whoops, 5 equals, 2x plus, and I'm taking it from here, see? 2x plus 3 divided by x squared. All right, so this is a little different from part b, see? So let's compare it for a second. Let's really have clear what we're asking the function. For part b, for part b, we plugged in 1, and we're asking the function, what is my slope when x is 1, see? Down here on part C, I am asking, if my slope is 5, what are my x values? So, like, where in my function is the slope 5? See? Where in my function is the slope 5? And because it's a quadratic, ¿cierto? It's something weird that probably looks like that, ¿cierto? It can have slope 5 in more than one place. It can have it here. It can have it there. Boom. So, that's the sort of thing that's going on. See? Again, for part C, we're asking, when my slope is 5, what is my x value? Before we said, if my x value is 1, what is my slope? All right, so right now we're trying to see if the slope is 5, if the slope of 5 shows up more than once in our function. See? And so if I go ahead and plug in 5 here, I now need to get the value of x. See? Now, from here, all right, I think it's a little hard to solve it like by hand, I mean it's possible but it, I think it's pretty hard and so what I would suggest, all right, in order to find the values of x I would do a calc intersect sort of thing, see? So this right here is going to be y1 when I say y1 I make reference to this y equals over here, okay? Over here it's going to be my y1 and over this all, whole other thing is going to be my y2, see? 
And if I do calc intersect, I'm going to get the answer for my x values. All right. I have a quick video on the calc intersect trick that you can look it up. It's around there. I'm sure you'll find it. See? But if I go ahead and graph this, all right, there is my y1, cierto, the, the 5, and there is my y2. And as you can see, cierto, I'm just going to draw it out re really quickly. See? As you can see, I have something that looks like this. I've got one line. I've got one line cutting that goes something like that. And then it goes like this. See? So that, that is f of x. Okay? And then over here, I have this the famous uh, 5. Cierto? This 5 here, the y1. Right? And so how many times does it, does it intersect? It intersects three times. Here, here, and here. So basically, trusting the process and everything and blah, 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 right? Actually, this, yeah. Trusting the process and everything and blah, 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 we can identify that. Um, we can identify that my function f of x has a slope of 5 in three locations. Cierto? One of them is when it is tangent to L, cierto? as we found in part B. It is tangent, tangent to L once, right? And then the other two times, it is some other parallel line. See? And so your answer would be uh, three times, including L, or two other times besides L. See? You can get full credit just showing the graph, or you can also get super mega technical and find the x values. See? How would you find the x values? Well, you would need to find the coordinates of each of these three points. See? How can you do that? Well, what I would suggest is go over here, go to second trace, so you hit calc, and find the intersect. See? You find the intersect. Whoops. Find the intersect. Go ahead and use guess to pick which one you want to choose, or pick which one, yeah, pick which one you get the answer for. And there you go, writing down the x values. See, so for the first one, it would be negative 0 0.68. See? I'm not going to show you the rest of the calc intersects because I don't want to make this video super long. But as you see in the answer key, that is one way you can find it. See? One of the ways you can do it is showing all your the x values. I just showed you how. The other one is simply graphing it, which I think is more intuitive, finding the three points, right? And leaving very, very clear, as I said here, you either say that it is three times including L, right? As it can say here, you can say that it's three L's including L, or there are other two, okay? Whatever's more intuitive, whatever works for you, that is number 11.